For this talk, we have uh, David Linder. David is the Vice President of Solutions at Invisium. He's an experienced application security professional with over 15 years experience in the computer security industry. During his time, David's worked with multiple disciplines in the security field from application development, network architecture design and support, IT security and consulting, security training and application security. Over the past eight years, David has specialized in all things related to mobile applications and securing them. David has supported many different clients, including financial, government, automobile, healthcare, and retail. In his spare time, David hones his mobile and IoT testing skills by participating in numerous bug bounties. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if I'm not loud enough, let me know. Uh, I've got a pretty big voice like Greg. Um, thanks for coming today. I'm going to talk about some IoT stuff, uh, kind of the attack footprint, threat model uh, of IoT, where we're at. Um, and, and kind of move forward. But first, Greg kind of went over who I am. Um, that's me. Uh, I golf a lot. I hack a lot. So they call me Golf Hacker Dave. I do both at the same time, usually. Um, one thing you'll know, want to know about me is I'm a little salty. Um, actually, at work, I have what they call the LSI, the Linder Saltiness Index. Um, and one of my uh, coworkers graciously put this together for me and said, well, I tracked your saltiness level, well, which I update my Slack messages about um, throughout the day. And there's one sharp contrast here that you can see, right? I should probably eat and drink more. Because <laughs> everything else drives it way up. So before I d dig into the things I like to talk about, I'd like to know who my audience is. Who here is, would consider themselves a security analyst? Okay. How about any developers? Managers? Man, what does everyone do? <laughs> Lead hacker? Okay, so I, I saw like five hands total raised. What do you guys do? We'll answer the question. Are, you, are the students? What's that? We come to conferences. That's all you do? Cool. I like it. I want that job. So uh, what I'm going to talk about today, I'll talk about IoT, kind of what it is, its history. Uh, we'll go through kind of the threat landscape of what I see IoT uh, posing to us. Uh, I'm actually going to try to address the issues, which doesn't usually happen. Usually someone stands up here and says, oh, all your shit's bad, and then walks out of the room, right? Well, I like to try to actually address things, um, which is something that our community has to get better at. Uh, and then maybe go over the future of IoT, um, not necessarily like 10 years down the road, but like tomorrow future. So <clears throat> what is IoT? Um, we used to call these things embedded devices. So it's just a new term for it, right? It's actually been around for quite some time. It's like we just changed the words to make them sexier um, so other companies can sell shit, right? I mean, that's really what it comes down to. Um, but Fax machines, printers, scanners, cameras, badge readers, all that stuff, I would consider IoT. Well, that's been around forever. And they're still here, right? So it hasn't really changed. It's just gotten more uh, excessive, if you will. So NIST actually defines things. Anyone work with NIST controls? I pity you. Uh, <laughs> So they actually define it as the network of things, right? And they have a control, the NIST 800-183 for this. Um, and they define a uh, network of things as five separate components. There's the sensor, which I would consider hardware, firmware stuff. Uh, aggregator, which is just your software layer. Communications, obviously we understand what that is. Uh, external utilities, which is kind of like a bucket catch-all for your mobile apps, web apps, cloud, what have you, right? Uh, and then decision triggers, which would be like your business logic or any logic that's in the code. They separate that out. Um, I don't recommend reading it because they're boring documents, but uh, I summarized it pretty, pretty good for you there. So what I want to do is I want to make an IoT device today, okay? So I grabbed this. I said, hey, let's make a, a water flow monitor for your home because we all probably have them in our home already, right? Uh, but let's, let's connect it. Right? Not just where they can scan it from the street, but let's put it on the internet. Right? So based on what NIST says, let's, let's add some sensors throughout your home. Now you can sense different things, temperatures, uh, different water flow, 
you know, whatever you might want to sense throughout your home. Oh, and let's create mobile and web apps too. You see where I'm going with this? <laughs> okay. Um, well, if there's a mobile and web app, we probably have some sort of cloud infrastructure or something that they're talking to. So we now have what used to be just this little guy has turned into this thing that's all over the place. And you know, it's in your home, it's in your apartment building, wherever it is, uh, and it's being exposed externally. So what can this thing do? Uh, these are just some things that came off the top of my head. Maybe leak detection, flow rates, temperature, maybe the ability to turn on and off your water, uh, usage stats, um, maybe it can determine what appliances are being used. So based on the water flow, maybe it says, oh, well, that's probably a water softener. Or that's just your, your um, refrigerator making ice, right? Um, maybe it can contact people in case of an emergency. A lot of IoT devices are doing that now. That's a little bit scary. Anything else this might be able to do? Come off the top of your head? I like this to be interactive, so if you're just reading my PowerPoint, it's kind of boring. Do your taxes. I wish it would. That would be awesome. <laughs> yeah? Yes, yeah, I'd believe that. What's that? Sure. Yeah, definitely. Yep. Sure. Heck yeah. Yeah, I definitely, with usage stats, who knows what, what you could determine. Like, hey, dummy, stop using so much water in the shower. So is security relevant for something like this? The obvious answer is yes, right? Uh, of course it is. There's a lot involved, even in a system like this. There's tons of data that may or may not be important to you, um, but all that data could track you as a person, if you will, right? When it comes down to it, all that data uh, can be manipulated, compiled, whatever you want to call it, um, and know exactly who you are, where you live, all that good stuff, right? Obviously, there's connections, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, uh, you know, GPS stuff, maybe net mesh networking. Um, all of that stuff is definitely going on in these IoT devices. Um, and then the hardware. Obviously, there's a lot of different hardware involved. You have main devices, you have the sensors, you've maybe got mobile devices involved, uh, maybe some bridges that, that are being used in the, the overall system. Um, so yes, security is relevant. It might sound simple when you go into Best Buy, oh yeah, cool, water flow sensor, I'll just go throw that on my, my network and it's going to tell me all sorts of cool stuff. Uh, but these are the things that we're not really thinking about as manufacturers uh, and as consumers of, of these things. So what are the typical security hurdles uh, for, for these sorts of things from a manufacturing standpoint? Um, Mobile kind of screwed things up for us, in my eyes, from a security perspective. Uh, we're doing things really, really, really fast. You've got to be first to market, right? If you're not first to market, you've probably failed, uh, unless the first to market fails, right? Um, so there's a speed thing to it. Uh, there's a cost of manufacturing, you know, there, you know, depending on how many different sensors, the type of hardware that's needed. Um, and then there's perceived security of the device, which frankly, I don't think people care. Right? Do you think people really care? If that device does something cool, do they think about security when they go to the store to buy it? No. Right. There's, and, and plus, hey, oh, this, this can do something cool. I don't think about everything else, right? So, <laughs> unfortunately, that's being used to the advantage of the manufacturers, right? Um, and they do things very quickly, um, which honestly, I think mobile created this whole agile push, right? It's just speed. We can do things faster, um, which may or may not be good. Uh, quick question. Yeah. So just to back up on your sensors, are those already internet-enabled sensors that we're using? They could be, right? I mean, or they could connect through the main device, which is then internet-enabled. But there's something within that system that's connected to a network. So then there's the user behavior. You know, 
what is safe for me to actually use this device? Um, is it safe that I'm in Florida on vacation and I can push a button and turn my water on and off? Right? Is that safe? Maybe. But think of it beyond that. That means that there's some sort of connection from me in Florida to my home, to my home network. Right? Um, how, how far and fast do we push this boundary, right? You know, water flow sensor is probably pretty minimal. But when you start installing all of these sensors in other facets of our life, whether it's at work, at home, you got to start asking yourself, what can we do and what should we actually do? Um, I'll talk about some of that in the future and some of the things that are being done um, today. So, but let's talk about the landscape, the threat landscape. Uh, of IoT and kind of how I see it. Now, some of this stuff, I'm going to talk about wearables too because they are kind of IoT in my eyes. Um, most people have something, some sort of wearable. But there's a lot of threats, right? Uh, malware, social engineering, you know, data theft, um, BYOD is a problem, botnets, all this stuff still is a problem with IoT. It's just we're putting all these things everywhere, right? Um, but what are the attackers after? Yeah. Resources, data, access, money, control, maybe just to make you mad, you know, uh, be a burden. Yep. <laughs> and there's, there's all sorts of avenues of attack here. It's, it's not just an exposed port for some website somewhere, right? I've got devices, multiple different devices, probably multiple communication channels. Um, different web components, cloud components, all this stuff in one system, and it's all got to be secured. So it looks kind of like this, you know, and, and that's definitely not all the arrows, right? Those sensors could be exposed to the internet. Who knows? Um, you know, you could speak directly from the mobile app to a sensor. Um, this is just kind of high level of all of the different communication that may be going on, you know, whether it's Bluetooth, or HTTPS, or TCP, WebSockets, what have you, right? Um, there's a lot going on here. So where can we screw up with all of this? All over any point? All Everywhere, <laughs> right? Everywhere, and we do, uh, for numerous reasons. I mean, those sensors are so minimal from a computing standpoint that a lot of the times they, they, they're not even powerful enough or they worry too much about the battery life that they can't do simple things such as like HTTPS or TLS because the battery life will just be destroyed, okay? So as a manufacturer and as a consumer, I've got to understand all this at least a little bit to realize that it's not just me buying some water flow sensor. I'm now exposing things uh, that I'm not usually exposing to an internet of people who don't like people. <laughs> I mean, let's just get down to it. So let's talk about attacks against the actual devices themselves. So the, the monitor and the sensors, right? So I would say there's a pretty low likelihood that someone's going to attack that device. Um, more than likely, you would need some sort of physical, maybe close proximity type access uh, unless there's a way to remotely do it or steal someone's mobile device, but that gets into a whole nother story. Um, small victim pool, right? So it's probably a device or a installation instead of many, right? Um, but if there are input APIs that are exposed, you know, that can always go up. Uh, impact, maybe medium. It just depends, right? Uh, Data compromise is probably an issue. Uh, manipulation and control in the, set, in the case of this is probably the biggest thing. Um, and if you can pivot into the local network. I mean, frankly, that's what I'd be looking for in a case of a water sensor, right? I don't care what the temperature of your water is, but I do care if I can install some back door into this internet connected system and now I'm on your network, right? And now I can look around and, and see what else you have exposed. Mm -hmm like your tax information that this water sensor just processed for you, right? But the thing is, 
They're so minimal and, and, and they don't, they're not complex. You don't have to be a hacker to do this on these devices, right? I mean, those sensors are probably tiny um, and maybe all they're doing is collecting data, but if they're somehow connected into your network, game's over, right? So what about attacks against the communication channel? This is the one that um, I would say most of the IoT devices that I've looked at struggle with, um, is the communication channels. And mostly in the Bluetooth category, right? So <laughs> Bluetooth 4.0, BLE 4.0 was, was released in 2010. Uh, low power, low cost, low bandwidth, latency, all that good stuff sounded amazing, right? But it had some massive security issues. Um, so they, they fixed a lot of those in BLE 4.2, but the problem with that is, is a lot of the hardware and such doesn't support it. So a lot of them are still stuck on 4.0, right? And now 5 is available, and like nothing supports that yet, right? So we're in this, this like Google mode, and we'll talk about Google in a little bit, where the only way to fix it is to upgrade your hardware, right? And manufacturers are like, well, why would we do that? People don't care about the security. Um, other things they're using, HTTP and co-op. Anyone here heard of co-op? No one? So obviously you've heard of HTTP. That's your typical web browsing protocols, right? It's, it's a very heavy protocol, right? So a lot of these manufacturers are moving to co-op, which is like HTTP but much lighter. Um, and they do that for... Battery reasons, resource consumption, right? Um, it has all the same benefits of HTTP. Uh, you can do co-op from a TLS standpoint. Um, it just works at a lower level. Um, so unfortunately, we're seeing more of that, but we'll get into that in a little bit. So attacking the communication channel, you still probably need physical or close proximity access. It really depends on the device, right? I mean, if that actual device is exposed to the internet, you know, you definitely don't, right? Um, but I'll talk about some ways that, that they've been exposed in, in my experience. Um, more than likely, there's multiple victims in this case. Um, communication channels are established standards, so people understand where flaws might be already. Um, you know, they're not writing their own, thank God. Um, lots of plain text APIs are going on here because they're not doing encryption. So I recently looked at one <laughs> and it exposed, basically you plugged it in, it exposed a captive portal and the only thing it did that for is it needed to get information about your Wi-Fi network. So you'd connect to its access point and you'd enter Wi-Fi information. Once you were connected to the AP, it sent that Wi-Fi information in clear text. Just a JSON request in clear text and applied it to the system, and then it connected to the network. The problem was it took in three parameters, and two of them were uh, exploitable from an RCE standpoint, right? So we could remotely execute code on that device, and we were able to then backdoor into the device, and now we're on the network, right? Um, so if they, if they wouldn't have necessarily exposed the plain text, it would have been a little bit harder for us to do that because they're like, oh, well, we've got network isolation turned on. Yeah, well, it's still in clear text, right? It doesn't solve the problem. Um, so there was definitely data camp compromise over the air. I mean, outside of the fact that we could break into the device itself, it's going over clear text. Now I know your SSID and the password I need to connect to it. That's being just sent over the air, right? Um, and there possibly be some data manipulation control of parent devices, maybe back-end systems, if you get access through some communication channel. Um, and then probably tracking, right? Um, it just depends on what that attacker wants to do. So where would I go if I was a bad guy, right? Well, these are everywhere, right? Look, I mean, can you imagine all the shit in a big apartment building? Just go in and start listening, right? Or set up a uh, pineapple Wi-Fi with the name AT&T or, or Hilton or whatever it is that people are automatically going to connect to. Um, 
I, I just, I don't know, or, or, or a really close type neighborhood. Um, other places I would go, any ideas? Yeah. Here. Here, yeah, sure. How about a gym, right? How much data is being transmitted and transferred with all the different devices that people have now? Sure, yeah. yeah, Super Bowl, right? I mean, heck, the, uh, the Olympics this last year, they had sensors like all over the place, all over. I was like, can I get involved in helping with that? No, nah, we're good. Yeah, never, never heard anything there, but they were tracking everyone and everything that everyone did um, with sensors throughout all their different buildings. So how about parent devices? We don't have any mobile device problems, right? Well, the biggest problem in my eyes isn't necessarily security, but people lose these things all the time. Leave them in cabs or in airplanes or uh, on a bench in coffee shops, wherever it is. It's actually lower now, but that's because they're not being stolen as much because of some of the protections that Apple and Google and so on have put into the devices themselves. Um, it's a lot harder to steal it and turn that around for profit because you can't necessarily wipe it as easily. But still, 5.2 million devices in 2014. Um, that was the latest, latest stat I could find. Um, but it's probably about similar to that today. So attacks against the mobile device, usually you would probably need some sort of physical access to said mobile device. That's not real easy um, to do. More than likely, you would need root access to do something. So you'd have to jailbreak or root that device, which again, isn't, isn't as easy to do today as it used to be. Um, and the fact that many devices are lost or stolen each year. Uh, and devices aren't up to date. And I'll show you some stats about that here in the next slide. Uh, impact, probably medium. You know, if you compromise that device, that water flow sensor is probably the least of your worries, right? With all the different apps of people. I think they said the average user of a mobile device today has about 150 apps on their device. They probably use five of them. But just in case, I need that tape measure that sends my data to China, right? Um, smaller victim pool, uh, but, you know, with data manipulation and control, you know, the the attacker would love to get a hold of that device. So what happened that was big in 2016? Um, a lot of cyber espionage and spyware stuff going on. Uh, Pegasus and Exaspy, uh, iOS and Android respectively. Um, they were trying to target high profile, high level executives. Uh, and basically they were spying on them, you know, text messages, recording calls, you know, anything that they could do when they got onto those mobile devices. Um, but one of the problems I see with mobile uh, is the fact that Android is still way behind when it comes to getting devices updated. I mean, if you look at those numbers, I don't know if you can see that all the way in the back, but the newest versions of Android, uh, of Nougat, which is 7.0 and 7.1, 2.8% of devices are running that, 2.8. Whereas you look at iOS, and 79% of devices are running almost 80%, or almost, uh, iOS 10, right? So, but you have to go way back in the Android stack to like Jelly Bean before you get to, you know, the iOS numbers. That's a problem, and, and it's a problem that Google PR and marketing has tried to address, and they've tried to kind of pull out security components and pro provide the ability to update, but as a manufacturer, wouldn't you just want people to buy new devices and spend more money? So that's really, there, there's three cooks in the kitchen. There's Google, manufacturers, and then cellular providers. And they're all doing their own thing. So this is why we've run into this, and I don't see us coming out of it anytime soon. So you can hate on Apple all you want in their dictatorship ways, but from a security perspective, it's working better than Google. I don't think it will ever change, though. I, mean, you think I don't know if it can.
it's not necessarily going to trash. It's going to get reused in Africa or wherever else. You know, oh, sure. Where people have money for a brand new one. Uh, and it's not going to be able to run the newest version. So that, I mean, that's never going to change. If they don't have Android, they'll be using some other skipped down uh, version of whatever they can put on the device. So like, just go back to the Nokia stuff, right? Like just. <laughs> But no, I, I, I get it, right? <laughs> but, but you're right. I mean, it's, it's, it's not going to change with that many cooks in the kitchen um, without Google saying, all right, you can't change our OS anymore, right? But even then, it is fairly hard. I mean, anyone here do Android development? Oh, my God. I pity you, man. Like, th the fact that you look at this, or look at the numbers here, and now you gotta decide what versions of Android are you writing your, your app for. It's not as easy in iOS, and you can just move to the new one fairly quickly, but you gotta support two or three or four major versions back to support all your users. And that sometimes requires some drastic changes in your code. Right? <laughs> So what about attacks against cloud, right? Cloud is definitely uh, one of those terms. I mean, it's, it's not really that different than what we're used to. It's just how the data is hosted and, and all that good stuff, right? But this is where the, the real stuff is exposed. If you're talking data and information, right, it's exposed within the cloud or whatever the backend infrastructure might be. Um, so attacks against multiple victims is common. If I was the bad guy and I wanted data, I'm not gonna run an attack against the stupid Fitbit you're wearing. I'm gonna find where that data is housed, the back end stuff, and try to find a problem there, right? Because I'm gonna get all your data instead of just one of you. Um, you know, attackers would need to exploit the vulnerability that's in the cloud, not necessarily something that's on the device itself. Now, there is one example. So Fitbit had an issue. Uh, I think it was t end of 2015, uh, where a researcher was uh, able to um, package like tiny kilobits of data into a Bluetooth stream uh, and infect the parent mobile device with it. Now, they didn't take it any further than that, um, but more than likely, it would have been infecting, you know, whatever the back-end cloud infrastructure was, too. Um, granted, it was just a tiny amount of kilobit data that who knows what they could have done in that space. Um, but impact is definitely gonna be high. This is, this is where you get Wall Street Journal front page, right? This is the targets, the Home Depot, stuff like that, where they've exposed millions of users' data, right? So impact to an organization is gonna be very high. Um, and then, you know, depending on what that data is, you can probably track and single out um, victims. So how do we address some of these issues, right? Uh, it's not easy. It's not, it's not ever going to be easy. Um, but here are some things that I think we need to do. Fixing the devices themselves. Since there's so little um, and their ability to, to process a whole lot of things is, is minimal, I say don't store a whole lot of data there. Push the data to central as much as possible just to get rid of it, whatever data you're collecting. Have some sort of poison pill, right? If that device or whatever hasn't checked in in a while, kill it off and it's you know, back to factory re reset or whatever else. Very easy to, to implement. Um, make data as anonymous as possible. So say I found your Fitbit or I was able to steal my you know, water device after it was returned, right? That data shouldn't be tied back to a specific person, if at all possible. Um, turn the device off when not in use or not needed for communication. So I actually recently looked at an IoT device, um, and it was really, really hard to dynamically assess. Uh, it only used WebSockets, but it only used them when it needed to, and it would shut everything down when it wasn't exposing that, right? And it only pushed from the device to the back end. It didn't allow any communication the other way. 
which is also is number five here. You know, if at all possible, just push. Don't allow, you know, push and pull data from the back end. Don't allow or the back end to actually modify that device, if at all possible. Obviously, that's not going to happen in every case. But in the case of this, all it was doing is data collection. And it's like, oh, cool, I'll just do this WebSocket quick. Do you have any data for me? If not, I'll shut it back down. Great question. So the back end can still modify the device, but what I would like to see is that device only pushes and pulls. So it will push something and then it will query like say a queuing system and say, hey, do you have data for me? It's not the other way around where the back end just says, hey, here's a bunch of data. You know, it, it's not making the communication. The device is controlling all of that, right? So what that is, is that lessens the ability for, for anyone to remotely tie into that unless they've compromised the back end, right? Because it's not exposing an open port that's accepting traffic, if you will, because it's controlling all that from the device. Um, fixing communication channel issues. So here's another thing we have a problem with in InfoSec, right? We can't come up with terms that are the same for everyone, right? If I said, what do you think a pen test is? I'd have 27 different answers, right? Same thing goes for Bluetooth here. Uh, iOS calls uh, the different things, whether it's, uh, you know, the device or whatever else, the central and peripheral. So the iOS device itself is the central. Whatever the other devices is connecting to is the peripheral. Android calls a client server, okay? Chipset manufacturers, they call them master slave. So you would think we'd be able to come up with common terms here, but this is good to know because you can get kind of confused uh, when they're weaving in and out. Um, you know, I would like to see everything using BLE 4.2 or 5 now, uh, but again, you know, we've talked about this. A lot of the, you know, external type devices, they can't support it. Um, but I would like to see that because it's much stronger than 4.0 was. Uh, I mean, iOS 8.2 and Android 4.3 will support those communications. But the, it, it's not necessarily the mobile device's issue, it's, it's whatever they're connecting to. So the other thing is talking about the authentication scheme. So there's basically four different communication schemes when it comes to BLE. Um, there's just works, please don't. Don't use that ever. Um, if you buy a device that uses it, take it back. Um, Basically, there's no authentication at that point. Uh, it just connects. It'll connect to anything. Most of your Bose headphones, systems, uh, was it Sonos, all your speaker type things, this is what they use. Everyone see the Bose problem lately? Anyone have the QC35s? Me? <laughs> so anyway, Bose was exposing users playlist data and all that through their mobile app that they tell you to download with the headphones you just buy. So that's a big hubbub right now. Um, the other one's numeric comparison. Um, this one's better, right? Uh, usually it's set up before you connect, so you'll buy something uh, and within the manual it says, hey, here's the six digit passcode that you're gonna need to connect to this Bluetooth device. That's better. Um, unless that's the same passkey used in all the devices you've now delivered, right? Uh, passkey entry is the other one where it creates or the device creates a random, you know, six to whatever digit passcode. Um, the only thing here is the device you're connecting to has to be able to display it. So <coughs> it won't work for everything. What I would like to see is everything use out of band. Um, but there is a problem with using out of band. Um, but out of band is basically allowing to use certificates, things like that, to, to initially pair the devices. Um, the problem is, is like iOS still doesn't support out of band Bluetooth. Still. The only time it uses it is when it talks and connects to your Apple Watch. That initial pairing, that little screen that everyone's seen there, that's using out of band um, to, to connect and, and talk. Um, 
So iOS in general, from an application development standpoint, only supports passkey or just works in their core Bluetooth. I don't know why. Um, they don't provide access to NFC or anything like that that would allow them to do the out-of-band pairing. Android, it's supported out-of-band pairing for as long as I can remember, right? So they do have that ability. Um, it's pretty easy to set up. Um, most of the time it's done through NFC, you know, so you need close proximity type access to do it. Um, so definitely use that within Android. So how do we fix some of the other communication channel issues? Well, <laughs> TLS, 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 right? How many times have you heard that? Lots. Um, I don't know why they're still not using it. Um, or you can use DTLS, which is the lighter version, the co-op version of TLS. Uh, it definitely does not have the overhead that your HTTP protocol does. Um, I would love to see cert pinning wherever you can, um, especially when highly sensitive data is involved. So you know for sure what device is talking to what device, right? Um, I usually recommend cert pinning in any mobile app anymore. Um, depending on the app and who the client is, um, will probably depend on what the risk is if they don't. Um, a lot of the frameworks, say like Alamo Fire for iOS, if you're an iOS developer, it's like five lines of code and you're doing cert pinning. It's so easy to do now. Um, there are some downfalls and drawbacks, but um, in my opinion, it's worth doing um, with the drawbacks. Like for instance, one of the drawbacks is if you update your certificate on the server, you obviously have to update your app, right? If that server cert changes, I need to know about it in the application. And that could cause issues if someone's not tracking when that expires, right? But other than that, there's no reason to not do it. Um, so DTLS, since no one really here raised their hand when I said co-op, um, it's the datagram transport layer security. Right? It's at a lower level. It's much lighter weight. Um, it is very closely related to TLS. Um, it supports strong cipher suites, right? Um, so we're seeing more of this, thankfully. Um, there are different security modes for DTLS. NoSec um, disables it, so let's not do that, right? <laughs> um, and then there's pre-shared key, uh, which you know, authenticates both endpoints. Uh, raw public key uses some sort of public key encryption. Uh, to encrypt the traffic, and then you can actually set your own cert. So it's fairly similar to TLS. You know, if you're, you know, certificate based, you're talking like client cert communication, things like that. Um, but that gets a little heavier as you go down that stack, right? Uh, most of the implementations I've seen use pre-shared key. So how do we prevent attacks against the mobile device? Anyone here have to deal with Managing many, many mobile devices at work? Yeah. How fun is that? It's not. No. Um, you know, it's been a problem for a while. Do we do BYOD or do we, do we purchase and, and distribute company devices? Um, but it's really all about the device and the app protections and the app applications that you're allowing them to download. Um, you know, Using the OWASP mobile top 10 controls, it's a little bit different top 10 list. It talks about how you can control and, and where those need to be implemented uh, with, throughout the ecosystem of a mobile device. Um, disconnecting from peripherals when you don't need to be talking to them is probably a good idea. You know, like not having those channels exposed if you don't need them um, is probably a best practice here. Um, when you do need them, you should scan for the devices in, in this order. You should first retrieve any that are already connected. You should, if there's nothing connected, then retrieve known peripherals, whatever they might be, and then scan, right? That's like your last ditch effort. Um, and that will help from a you know, overhead standpoint as well. You know, if you scan first, you're probably using a whole lot more resources uh, than is necessary. Um, what about uh, the apps themselves, right? Apps are definitely a problem child when it comes to security. Um, so 
I like to talk about the OWASP top nine here. Anyone else familiar with OWASP and all the political issues going on right now? So I say the OWASP top nine for the mobile because number 10 is, in my opinion, not something we need to talk about. Um, but the one thing I will mention here is if you look at the first one, M1, weak server-side controls is the number one issue with mobile apps, right? Something to remember when you're assessing mobile applications um, and all of that. And there's a top 10 for cloud as well, right? How, how, do, how do we protect our backends? Um, <coughs> so, you know, these are probably talks all in and of themselves. So I don't like to go into detail, but if you have questions, we can talk afterward about some of this stuff. Um, but definitely check them out, as that will help. Um, so what about the future? Um, we're in an interesting time. Uh, like I said, I think mobile has driven this agile world of speed um, and doing everything kind of in a, a process and getting away from waterfall approach to everything from security to development, right? Um, and I think the key of the future and the problem child is going to be applications. And when I'm talking apps, probably mobile apps. Um, it will definitely be an issue, especially in the wearables world. I mean, wearables have just exploded and they're not going anywhere. I mean, I think like they said 500 billion are in use or something like that. That's insane. Um, starting to add stuff to locking systems. So this was at uh, one of the most recent uh, CES. Uh, Master Lock has all these connected locks now that connect right to the internet and you can unlock them from wherever. That's pretty awesome, right? <laughs> Not sure about that. Hey, I'll let my dog out when uh, they shouldn't. Um, sleep health, this has been huge. Like sensors are built into everything now. Selling beds, the full bed has sensors built into it that are then connected to the internet. Interesting. How about all the appliances? We're connecting all of them because you definitely need a toaster that you can connect to the internet, right? Why? <laughs> um, oh, and they're all talking now, right? All the appliances are talking now to each other. Um, about, hey, it's, it's time to change your, your, your laundry and, and get a beer from the fridge, right? Like, you get a notification that, you know, so. This is the one that I see is, is most problematic, but also something really cool, right? Um, we're getting more about data facilitated care. Um, you know, with all of the health care issues we have, this is something really neat. Nike's doing a lot of work. Um, it all started with, um, you know, athletic stuff, right? Like we're going to build sensors into our, our uh, clothing, our shoes, everything else, targeting athletes to monitor things from muscle growth and, and how much they're being used and all that stuff. But now they're, they're building it out more, um, you know, for doctors and things like that. High mirror, which is the other picture here, is an interesting one. Um, at first it was touted as this, this mirror that changes the lighting, like for women to put their makeup on so they see how they look different in different lighting. Um, but it's actually being used now to detect skin health problems, right? So they're, they're touting this, but there's all these apps and sensors and things now that will allow you to communicate directly with your doctors and they can tell how your health has changed over a period of time. Um, and I can see that benefiting people, but that gets a little scary too, because the amount of data and things that's being collected there could be an issue. Stop smoking. Uh, Chrono Therapeutics is creating this patch-like thing that's connected. Um, within it, it has little doses of the things you need to help you stop smoking. That seems like that could be an issue too if you get overdosed, right? <laughs> but that's coming. Um, breast cancer detection. So they're actually building sensors into clothing and bras that can detect small discrepancies uh, for, for breast cancer detection, which is kind of neat. 
Um, so that's coming as well. All that's connected right to their doctors, right? Or at least that's their plan. Definitely going to be breaches in the future, right? There is so much data being collected from all these devices. Probably data that we never thought would be collected, right? Like Bose. Why is Bose collecting data on the songs that I'm listening to? I never would have thought they'd be doing that, but of course they were, and they got called out for it. Um, you know, why are fitness trackers tracking where you are at any given point in time? Anyone here use Strava? <sighs> so Strava is a way to track um, things you've done. I walked two miles today from point A to point B. Uh, I ran this course. Um, and you can be what they call king of the mountain, right? Um, the problem with Strava is all you need is an account, and I can now find anyone that's using Strava. Anybody, right? Um, so I can see that, that you have now done a three-mile run from point A to point B, and I have a map showing exactly what you do. So me, I could now track you over time and find a pattern. I mean, it's just scary to think about all this data that they've collected about people, and it's just exposed, right? Um, so I'd, I'd find a different. Data mining, sharing, and regulation. We're already seeing some of this, right? They're already trying to regulate or deregulate some things um, when it comes to data. Uh, browsing history, ring a bell? Um, that's not going to be any different with all the other data that's being collected. Um, if I was trying to create uh, a new fitness device, for instance, it would probably be beneficial to me if I could buy all of Fitbit's data, right? Or get it somehow. So that's definitely coming, whether we like it or not. So, summary. These are tiny devices for the most part. Some new protocols, mostly all the same problems that they were used to. It's just more of them. They're more prevalent. Um, there's more attack surface. Um, it, 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 they actually make it easier to find attack surface than ever before, right? Um, so we just got to take a breath, step back, get out of this speed mentality, and use what we already know about architectures, app security, cloud security, all that stuff, and start implementing that instead of, oh, well, we got to be first to market, so we're going to think about that stuff last or not at all. Because um, it's, like, it's like when mobile first came out. We'd been harping for years on uh, network security and app security, and then mobile dropped, and it was, it was a shit show. It was horrible. When the, when the Apple App Store opened in 2008, I was like, oh, this is, this is going to be bad. And sure enough, it was, right? Um, you know, that's, uh, it's been something of passion of mine forever, and I don't see that going away. Um, you know, mobile apps have gotten a little better, but... Um, it's still a speed thing for the most part. So, securing IoT is hard. Try harder, right? Questions, comments, concerns? Tell me I'm stupid. That's fine. Come on. Don't be shy. Nothing. Yeah. Have you disconnected a lot of your own IoT devices personally? Um... No, the ones I have, I have assessed, um, so I'm comfortable with them uh, from a security standpoint. Um, but like, if I'm going away for a while, I might just shut my router off because it's a little concerning. But you know, I've got a few things like Nest Cams; they're pretty good um, from a security standpoint, as long as you don't open it publicly, which people do and not know it. Um, but other than that, I don't really have a whole lot else that's really connected other than little wearables and stuff. And along with that, do you segment your network? So, like, I set your IoT just for communication? Uh, I mean, they're segmented through a single router. It's just a different SSID, but yeah. Anything else? Yeah. How do you feel about the future of, like, uh, healthcare wearables and whether or not they can ultimately be secured when we're well, considering that hospitals are one of the most insecure places there are, I, 
I don't know. It's going to have to get better. I think HIPAA is going to change probably sooner than later. That's going to force them. It's going to force their hand. I hope it, it is, right? I mean, their hand basically has to be forced. They're finally getting money in healthcare to help secure things, but it's, it's a slow process. You know, I mean, they're, they're behind the times if you try to compare them to, say, financial companies, right? But it's scary. I mean, you know, they're, they're going to start doing some interesting stuff with healthcare. I mean, the fact that, you know, we're losing doctors, we're not allowing, you know, smart people from all over the world to come in and be our doctors, it costs too much. If I don't have to go into the doctor and I can just push a button and it sends everything I need to send it to my doctor, I don't know, it might be worth it. All right, yeah. Uh, have there been any known security breaches in IoT? Oh yeah, baby cams, dolls, you name it. Um, there was actually, I don't remember what it is, some doll in Germany or something and there was like, yeah, right. Right, right, uh, and then, they said something about, well, if you don't destroy these now and you're found with one, you're going to be fined a bunch of money. But, but yeah, baby cams have been a, a known, known target for a while because uh, they just expose things with some known uh, address and whatever else. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else off the top of my head. I mean, the Bose thing was a, a pretty big hubbub the last couple of days. That they're, I mean, it's not, it's more privacy than security, right? Because, right. but they're grabbing all your data and sending it who knows where. Um, nothing real big yet. I mean, frankly, guys, let, let's... What about the denial of services that... Uh, oh, the... the, 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 the which one? The one, the one in Texas? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, there was the, the one in... Was it Houston, too, where they... They sent off all of the tornado sirens were going off. Does it have it on it? But that was my first exposure to a thing, right? An IoT, you know, some kind of innocuous home device that you could potentially get infected from. And that was, you know, early 2000. Oh, yeah. So oh, it's been around forever. It's been around for a long time. Just a lot of people aren't watching. I mean, the, the first, anyone have an idea when the first wearable was created? It was like in 1960. Yeah. Two MIT researchers created a device that helped them successfully predict the outcome of roulette. They got caught doing it, right? The one guy wrote a book about it, actually. But what it was, they had some belt thing and something like in their shoe, and then they had a little earpiece in here. And based you know, on whatever came up, he would, he would tap his foot a different way, and it would help them. They won. Like the one night, it was like 80, 80 grand or something. So two minutes. One more question? Yeah. The, the what computing? So, like, when we were talking about, like, the changing landscape, where they're storing data devices or the, the whole cloud computing thing that they're doing now. Yep. Do you see that changing the threat model overall, or is it still going to be more of the same? It, it's more of the same. I mean, it, it's not really any different than what we're used to. Um, you know, cloud is just a fancy term for a back end network, if you will, um, with different technologies you know, different types of data stores. Um, as someone who wants data, I'm always going to attack the back end because there's going to be more data accessible. So fix SQL injection, damn it. Ah, I'm talking about that for 20 years.
we still can't get it right. All right, guys, thank you. Appreciate it.